morning in chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 6 and 7, and we're going to talk about the secrets to having and keeping the peace of God. Uh, there's a lot of scriptures on peace in the Old and New Testament. And of course, but if we're going to even think about keeping the peace of God, we've got to know the peace of God, first of all. And so, of course, this is the prophecy of the Son Jesus being born and talks about him here. But Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. I know we only usually use this around Christmas time. Of course, it'll be here before you know it. But it's something that's in the scripture and it's something that's year round. It shouldn't be designated to one part of time. But unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Now look at these titles here. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then at verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government, and peace, there shall be no end. So, you know, a lot of people search for peace. One thing of my testimony that I had is I searched for peace in all the areas I could find. That's really what I wanted. It's really what anybody wants. They want peace and happiness in life and joy. And, of course, all that's found in Jesus. And uh, we didn't, some of us, like me, I didn't realize it till Jesus found me and he saved me. Then I realized what I was created for and what peace is really all about. And we try to find it in all the things of the world. And so if we're going to have it, now let me say this. It's possible for a believer to uh, lose his peace and feelings, especially with God and with people and with life in general. See, it's very possible. You read it in the scripture time and time again that, even believers can get depressed. You fight depression a lot. Uh, some, some, some people may seem like they don't, but the truth of the matter is that battles every day in their life. And it's, a, it's something that is tough, even for believers who have, I mean, look at the capabilities we have. Look at what God has blessed us with. We have the scriptures. We have the spoken, the breathed word of God. We have the fulfilled Word of God. I mean, even in the Old Testament, like we're reading here, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the Spirit of God indwelling them at all times. He would come upon them, and and then He would leave, and He would come upon them, and He would leave to do different uh, mighty acts that He did. But one thing about Him is He has peace. He is peace, and Jesus is peace and he says given these titles to our Lord Jesus Christ he said his government shall be upon his shoulder now shoulder is of course the the strongest part of man you know the shoulders the scripture talks about the shoulders a lot uh, I can tote things more heavily on my shoulder than I can just with my arms and so the shoulder, he's able to bear everything. Our God is a mighty God. He is big. His name shall be called Wonderful. And of course that means to wonder. And notice the capital letters now. This is a title that God has revealed to us that he is. And Jesus is wonderful. Sometimes you need to get along with God and just tell him. How wonderful he is. You need to remember how wonderful things God has done for you. It happens to me all the time. Sometimes I can't uh, understand and I forget how wonderful God is, especially when I get myself in the way and I get bogged down with situations of life and all that. That thing ain't working, brother. The sound ain't working. A little fuzzy, all right? Well, I can't do nothing about that one, I don't think. I stay fuzzy. That's why I shave all the time. <laughs> Get that peach fuzz off the head every now and then. Amen. But uh, wonderful. We need to remember sometimes how wonderful God is. And, that, and of course that's to wonder or to marvel. You know Jesus done a lot of things in the New Testament revealed. And it caused the people to marvel. And I'm telling you God has done things in our life when it really causes us 
to marvel. Sometimes we get so busy and so caught up in this world and ourselves that we lose the wonder that Jesus is. And if we're going to have that peace of who he is being the Prince of Peace, we need to forget or not forget one of his titles, and that is that he is wonderful, and that means extraordinary, hard to understand. The Scripture teaches us that we can't understand the things of God. They are higher than our thoughts. His thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways and our thoughts. And Romans 11.33 is one of those verses you can look at and along with Isaiah 40. You know, Isaiah had a, a pretty good revelation about God. I mean, he starts out when God met him and he realized he, is, he was a man of unclean lips and that he shouldn't be able to, God shouldn't even be able to be known of him and him know God, but that's the same with all of us. And Isaiah had a lot of revelations about the goodness of God and he's wonderful, he's extraordinary, he's hard to understand. And, and the wonder of God's acts and judgments and his act of redemption. That's something that's too wonderful for us. When we look at the cross and we see the cross, to man that looks like failure. But to God and to those that are his redeemed, it is triumphant. It is a victory when he said it is finished there. So we need to remember that Jesus is Wonderful. We need to spend some time sometimes telling him how wonderful he is. And I, I encourage you week after week and month after month to get alone with God. I can't stress that enough. Hey, we find ourselves by ourselves a lot anyway. Let's invite Jesus into that area and just see. God, God wants that relationship. God, we talked about a few weeks ago, how uh, when God desires not sacrifice, David said, or else I would give it. God desires a broken and a contrite spirit. God wants to break us so he can use us. We talked about the broken vessels and things that God uses. Well, God wants us to get along with him. God is that such a wonderful God. He wants time with us. And we can talk about all day long how much we love God. And we can talk about how much we love our wives and our kids and everything. But love is not spelled L-O-V-E. It's spelled T-I-M-E. It's who gets our time. Now you got to be careful. Because you'll try to do everything and the church can swallow up your time. The works of the gospel, the works of the church can swallow up your time. I've heard time and time again from many older pastors, if they could go back and redo some things, they would have spent more time with their wives and their kids instead of letting each little fire that popped up in the church consume them and took away from them. Next thing you know, 20 years have gone by and 25 years and your, your kids are gone and you know, and then you wonder, well, why ain't they spending time with me? Why can't I see them? And, well, maybe because you didn't spend much time with them. It happens. And so that's a warning that we can all uh, use. What's that song, uh, The Cats in the Cradle? You remember that old song? <laughs> it was the same thing. It was a truth. Although that was a worldly song, it is a truth about life. He realized at the very end that his son turned out just like him. And so we need to learn those lessons, but we need to learn to spend time with God. God's time is something that if spending time with him, we lay it up. We give God something to build with. You know, if he's building a mansion in heaven, and I believe he is, and it, it, wherever he's going to be is going to be a mansion to me. It's all about Jesus anyway. Or rooms, as some of the words and translations. He's got many rooms up there. I ain't getting into all that nitpicking stuff this morning. But I'm going to tell you, he's only going to be able to build what we sent him to build. 
So your reward in heaven is only going to be what you send up to heaven, whether it be time, monetary, or times with God. And remember, if we will seek him in secret, he will reward us openly. And that reward could be openly, the much more when we get before his presence. But he is the wonderful, mighty God. He is counselor. That means to advise, to consult, to counsel, to consult together, to exchange counsel. You know when some people have degrees of being a counselor, you know, and but sometimes we give counsel and we don't even realize it. But when a counselor gets with a person, they exchange counsel. That's what God is. Jesus Christ is counselor. You want to get the highest authority in the land? Just call on him. That's all you got to do. He's there. He is the counselor. He is the mighty God. That's the strong, mighty, powerful, the champion. There's none other like him. He's the greatest that ever has been or ever will be. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the everlasting father. The ancient of past time, the forever of future time, the continuous existence of God. There never has been a time when God was not, and there never will be a time when God will uh, exist not to be. That's just who he is. And we have access to him. But we talk about we need God's peace on different decisions, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But we seek God's peace sometimes, and it, sometimes it seems like, well, maybe we're scared about a decision we got to make or a move we got to make. The, you know, one of the greatest things that we could learn, and, and I see it all the time, people will get uh, all upset about something that takes place, somebody will hurt their feelings in church. Well, you know what? There's somebody in your family that's hurt your feelings before. You going to leave your family? How many times have your brother or your sister just ticked you off? <laughs> How many times have y'all fought? I'm talking probably not since you got grown, but well, even some grown brothers, they still duke it out, man. I mean, they will. Be 40, 50 years old, they'll start coming to blows from one another. But you know what? When they leave, they're still brothers. They're still in the family. They don't kick each other out. There's not a family that hasn't got baggage. We all got it. Every one of us. And you ain't got to go too deep in it. But we're still family. People will sometimes leave over the most crazy issues, but that tells me, look, that tells me that, that now if God's moved you, by all means, you need to go. Because you need to obey God rather than man. But there's something about being in the will of God that's very important. You've got to be in the will of God. If God has moved you to this place, then you need to stay at this place until God moves you. Don't move just because you got your feelings hurt. You'll be miserable from here on out. But if God's got you here, you've got to understand the will of God. And you've got to have that peace. There's been times that I've thought over the years that God was moving me. Well, he moved me. And don't be so shocked if God moved somewhere. God moved you here. God can move you somewhere else. So don't think it's like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm here for the rest of my life. Well, you may be. And you need to uh, bloom where you planted. But you need to be moved by that peace that only God can give because he is the prince of peace. And that's our next thing there. The ruler, the leader, the chief, the official captain. He's the one that gives peace. He's the commander, the head, the elder, the ruler of rulers. That's who Jesus is. He's the prince of peace. And uh, Dave Ramsey always ends his show that there's only one way to have financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. And that's truth. He is the Prince of Peace. Verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be 
no end. There's never going to be an end to his peace. Don't think we can uh, just get God's going to run out of grace and God's going to run out of peace and like there's they just wasn't enough left for me or there never will be enough left for me because he is the Prince of Peace. Now, on over into Isaiah 26, and I know you're kind of familiar with this passage of Scripture. In Isaiah 26, 3, and of course David again talking about this Prince of Peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. We, we're familiar with that as Christians, that passage of Scripture. And it's easy to spit that out when somebody's struggling with some peace. But you know what? He said, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. It's amazing how we can be going through trials and troubles and tribulations and afflictions and pain and heartbreak. And all the time it can seem like the, the winds are just tempestuous. They're just blowing everywhere. And man, there's something about that peace on the inside. That only comes from the Prince of Peace. And so that's who he is. He is the ruler of peace. Out of him comes peace. And so if we're ever going to have the peace of God, we got to know him and we got to keep our mind on the Prince of Peace. And remember, as a child of God, he who possesses peace possesses us also. Then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. Now, you say, well, this is a resurrection chapter. What's that got to do with peace? Well, we're going to look at one verse stuck here in the midst of 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to look at verse number 10. We're familiar with this one also, but you know what? It's still in the Word of God. It's thousands of years old being written, but it's still truth. And that's all we can do is stand on the truth and teach the truth and preach the truth and live the truth and believe the truth. The truth shall set you free and make you free. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, the rest of the verse is awesome. But if we don't remember nothing else, we need to remember that first part. But that's a conjunction. That means, uh, regardless of what the first few scriptures, and of course it talks about the gospel and things, and those seeing Jesus after his resurrection, Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So if there's any way we're going to understand and have the peace of God, we need to understand and never forget we are what we are because of the grace of God. I got news for you and I. We didn't start this, and we're not going to finish it. We didn't seek him. He first sought us. And then after that, he sought us and bought us. He teaches us to seek him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added unto you. Many scriptures that you know of in there, but when a person, and I've seen it from the higher-ups and theologians and things. It's amazing how God takes all of us from babes and he grows us up, all right? As we get older and older and then we get learning more and more and more and we get a little degrees, you know, kind of degrees is kind of like a uh, curls on a pig's tail that don't make no more ham, amen? <laughs> It'll just sit there and curl and curl and curl, but it don't make no more ham, Looks good. All right. Degrees okay. But don't let the degrees put you on a level higher than the fellow man because you know what? God, that's where God brought you from. We all start out the same. And we need to understand. And we need to learn. And we need to do all that. But we cannot let that learning uh, supersede that we are what we are by the grace of God. The reason you and I are anything is because of the grace of God. The reason you and I will ever be anything is because of the grace of God. We have what we have, our position, our title, our work. 
God has entrusted us to do a part of His work because of His grace. It's only His grace. And if we're going to have any kind of peace, we're going to have to understand and believe and never forget it is by the grace of God that we are what we are. It's not of all works. It's nothing that we have done. And then we go over to Philippians. And, of course, this is a very uh, familiar passage also in Philippians 1. And I know you know the scripture right off the top of your head, Philippians 1, 6. Uh, you know what? I've seen books written on this. I've read books written about this one verse. I've heard this as people's testimony about the one verse that moves them and sways them and keeps confidence in them and assurance. And, of course, that's what confidence means. But the truth of the matter is we need to understand here that being confident in this very thing that he which begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. When there's going to be times in your life when you're questioning your decisions, you're questioning where you are in God's plan for your life. Understand and realize He started it and He'll finish it. You just stay on the ship. You stay on the boat. We all talk about Peter. He got off the boat, but Peter didn't get off the boat till the Lord told him to come. What about the rest of them in the boat? They didn't have no faith. No, he didn't tell the rest of them to get out. Think about it. We criticize the others. Well, at least Peter had some faith and he got out of the boat and he walked on the water after God told him to. He didn't command the other 11 in the boat. They just stayed there. They was doing what God told them to do. So, But during those times that we don't have peace, we need to understand that God is doing a work. You are where you are. The Bible says that as he moves the rivers of water, so he moves the kings of the earth. He puts some up and he raises some. He lets some down. There's different rulers that come along, and that's what that scripture is talking about. And Psalms talks about it. I think it's in 89 and verse number 8, somewhere around in there, that says, Promotion cometh neither from the east nor the west, it's God that promotes one. He puts people up and he takes people down. Promotion comes from the Lord. You say, I want to move up. I want to be promoted. You need to do what you know is right. We talk about wanting to do the will of God. We'll never know more about the will of God for our lives until we start doing what we know is the will of God for our lives. And so we need to understand and remember God will perfect. He will complete his work which he started in us. We didn't start this work. And I tell you, you talk about the church. Well, I, I hear people all the time well, working at some companies. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. What is this company going to do when I'm gone? I do this and I do that and I do that. Dude, the company was going before you got there. And if God takes you home right now, the company is still going to be going. The church is no different. People become dangerous. They're walking in a dangerous predicament when they think because they leave or they get gone or God moves them that it's not going to keep going. And, and, you know, we say it all the time. I don't know what we're going to do around here when God moves or calls Sylvia and Larry home. Well, I don't know what we're going to do. There's going to be some shoes. It's going to be tough to replace. But you know what? God's got somebody already right now. Let me tell you, if God, if this is the last message I ever teach, there'll be somebody right here next week. Look at the teachers that's going on through this place. I'm talking about this in heaven now. Hey, I, I, we could name quite a few. You say, man, I don't know what uh, we used to think about. Man, I don't know what we're going to do when, when Bubba's not doing judgment journey down there. People, people, people. It's one on. Hey, the church is going to go on. What we got to do is stay in his will, have his peace, and understand that to be perfectly in his peace, we need to understand that he has begun a good work in you. He will perform it. He will complete it until the day that Jesus Christ comes, and that could be just coming to get us. Now, we'll finish up in chapter 4. And of course, uh, this is very familiar passage also, but 
If we're going to, the fifth point on the peace of God here is we need to understand in verse 6 and 7, we need to be anxious for nothing. You say, well, it don't say anxious. Well, it says be careful for nothing. It means be anxious for nothing. I can't tell you how many times. I remember a couple of years ago, I tried to get a trip up to Thailand. And I already had it lined up with a missionary. And I mean, it was like four different major doors closed. And I said, well, I, I, the first one that closed, well, well, we'll try it this way. Well, a couple of days go by through prayer and everything, that door closed. Well, we'll try it this way. And it went through a couple of days, that door closed. I said, well, I'm going to try it one more time hard-headed. I'm going to try it one more time. That door closed. And I, I, I text and email the people. I said, it's not going to happen. I mean, they was roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And it's almost like if I'm standing here trying to figure out what to do and God opens that door and says, you idiot, you're not going. It's not going to happen right now. That's kind of the way God had to do me. And I, I emailed them. I told them, I said, I've learned one thing over these years. When God is not opening doors, now every door ain't going to be perfectly open. Everything's not just going to be a tinkerbell, hit the magic wand, and it just happens. But when God starts shutting doors, it's not right. It's not time. Back off. And so that's the, some of the peace. That's being anxious for nothing. When you got a decision to make and something that's major, and I don't care if it's not really major, you need to pray about it. It's what God tells us right here. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. And everything. The Bible says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We're to be careful. For, we're not to get anxious. How are we going to figure this out and figure that out? And one of the, the things that we try to get different ministries off the ground and do different works that we got to do and you know we can become too anxious for that to happen we, we want it now well I don't understand why this door didn't open I don't understand why this person didn't support that or whatever or we riding out there, or we sitting there watching TV and all of a sudden that commercial comes on about that new truck hmm all of a sudden, it's like, man, sure would like to have that. Riding in a perfectly good vehicle. But we lose that, we lose that focus. Next thing you know, we walk in the dealership. We open the truck, and there's that new smell. Ah, zero percent, Mr. Pike. 84 months. Oh, man, I, you mean I ain't got to pay but $600 a month? Yeah. Come on in, baby. We get ourselves into problems when we don't when we're not praying about things, when we're too anxious about different things. And we go in and those things happen and you know God says it well we always say if if he orders it he'll pay for it, but if we order it he'll let us pay for it. Uh, Dave Ramsey calls that stupid tax. <laughs> I paid a lot of stupid tax over the years. I've done a lot of things like that that happens. But uh, be careful for nothing. Everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now look, at, look here in verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That is the peace. How are you going to know it? Well, you got to know the Prince of Peace. You got to know who he is. And you got to know his peace will never end. You got to keep your mind on the Prince of Peace. You need to understand you are what you are by the grace of God. You need to remember that he who started a good work in you will perform it. We need to not be anxious for nothing but pray about everything with thanksgiving. Then the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When those hard times are there, and we don't understand why it's going on, but all in the midst, I've been to funeral homes and seen people 
burying their loved ones and even some of their children. And I, to me, I'm all tore up. But to them, I see the grace of God implemented in such a way. The only God can do that. He pours out the grace when we need it. Then I'm done here, but think on the right things. And well, I'll read these scriptures right quick. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there's any kind of power, if there be any praise, think on these things. Then those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Here's my last thought here. We need to have a sabbatical. That means a time away. You know, it's okay to have a sabbatical from ministry. <gasps> oh yeah. It's good to get away. It's good to shut the normal down. And get along with God if you're going to do it. But then you'll find out some things. Have a sabbatical. I'm trying to help you here this morning. I'm not your enemy. Let's have a sabbatical from Facebook. I ain't even going to want to see how many cut it on this morning as soon as I got up. All social media. From the news media. Lord have mercy. Some of us need to just cut talk radio off. I've had to do it about the last two or three months. Enough of it, man. Enough of it. It's the same old garbage. I can't do nothing about it anyway. We need to have a sabbatical from toxic friends. We need to reconnect with the Prince of Peace. We need to think on the right things if there's any way we're going to have any peace. Father, thank you for your words this morning. We praise you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.